think I already mentioned it. Um, we're having a conversation, you know, about journeys and life. And I think we both have this story of being long at Google, you much longer than me even, <laughs> and both leaving, right? And there's, um, there's interesting things, right? And why, why we did that, why you did that. So that's sort of the context of, of where we're having this conversation. But maybe why, why don't we start just with an intro? I said a few things already. Yeah. But who are you, Avni? Goodness. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's actually really nice to be back in Zurich. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I was here for two years. And that's how Raphael, Raphael and I met. Um, a little bit about me, I guess. I am a computer scientist in electrical engineering by trade. That's what I studied. And I actually joined Google straight out of college. Uh, this was back in 2003. So back when Google wasn't really as well known, product management was even less well known, even by the people doing it. I remember on my third day, uh, my engineering lead came up to me and said, so you're our PM. What do you do? And I was like, I have no idea. Um, and that was kind of the first few months at Google. You kind of just got thrown in. Uh, you had to sink or swim. Luckily, uh, it turned out okay. And uh, I had an incredible ride there. I was there for 18 years. Uh, I got to work with amazing people on amazing products. I worked on search um, back in the early days. Got to work on personalized search in the beginning. Um, Google Maps with Raphael. Chrome helped grow that to over a billion users. Um, and then I spent my last five years at Google working on education, which was near and dear to my heart. I think we'll talk a little bit about that, maybe. Um, and then I left Google in 2021 uh, and have been on some boards, and but mostly just taking a break at the moment. Taking a break, yeah. <laughs> and I guess part of you taking a break is moving countries as well? Yes. So my family and I, we just moved to Amsterdam in july um it's great we love it uh you love the weather i guess oh yeah definitely love the rain california was too nice too nice <laughs> um i have kids they're eight and eleven and actually my husband and i were both in zurich at the same time working at google and it was really meaningful for us so we had always talked about kind of doing this with our kids and in particular for the reason of making us really uncomfortable you know, We'll talk more about being uncomfortable today, but we really just wanted to shake things up, show the kids that they can they can be uncomfortable and they can get through it and they will be stronger for it. Yeah, that's that's really you. Yeah. So you already mentioned, you know, fear and was was this too direct? <laughs> uh, I, I think I should be more gentle. I yeah, you told me I should be more gentle. Not really. Sorry. Um, you mentioned the uh, challenges, fear sort of playing a role, right? Growth in, in your journey. And, and when we prepped this, you know, fear was sort of a thing and a theme, right? Talk more about that and how, how did it help or not or guide you? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, when I kind of look back on my career over the times and I think about, okay, what were those moments where there was a, a step change? There was an inflection point. There's something different that happened. And the pattern that I started to notice is that those moments had deep fear associated with them. Like I was afraid of something. I was afraid of something new. I was afraid to ask for something. I was afraid to step into some, I was afraid to walk away from something. Um, and only through having worked through that each of those times was I able to make that step change or make that is really personal growth in more professional growth. Um, by getting through the other side of it. And so I started to associate fear with positivity, actually, that it's actually really important and it's actually something that is a positive signal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, you said, I mean, you now say it's something positive, but I guess the different kinds of fear is this, I mean, why would you say fear is something positive? That's not not obvious. <laughs> Um, you know, I think what it is, is fear is often, you know, okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get a little to your first, like, are there different kinds of, many different kinds? I think, um, there's, for me, I face fears, like ask for something for the first time. I thought, you know, if I, if I get told no, like, what does that mean? Or, Hey, I'm in this room and I feel like I don't belong here. Mm. Um, or, Hey, 
I kind of want to do this thing, but like, I don't know how to make this decision. And like, I'm really scared to make this decision because what if it's the wrong one, right? Like making the wrong decision seems really scary. Um, and each time I met with those, it, you know, in, in like in retrospect, it's like, well, yeah, of course, like if you're scared of something and it's going to like help you grow and then you're going to like get to the next stage, it's obvious afterwards. But in the moment, fear just feels like fear. Like it feels like you're staring in the face of a lion and being like, no, that's bad, right? Evolution has taught us that that is a bad thing. Um, so in the moment, it's not that obvious because there's all this swirl of emotion that's happening, right? Um, but it's when you get to the other side of it that you can really see what it means. Yeah. Um, is there like an example, like a good one to illustrate the concept? Yeah, thing yeah. You... Maybe I'll talk about the first one. Yeah. Um, so my first, the first time I kind of came face to face with like true fear um, was really the fear of rejection, right? So I think we kind of get what that means. Like you ask for something, you get told no. What does it mean that you got told no? Um, and it actually took me a few years to face this one in part because I didn't know you could ask for things mm -hmm. in the beginning. Right. Like I spent my first few years at Google just like looking around people like getting opportunities. And I was like, oh, they must have done something really good to deserve that opportunity. Could have. Um, but what was actually happening is they were asking for things and they were getting those things. And so it finally dawned on me. Right. It's like, oh, that's a good strategy. Um, and so a few years in, um, I was working for Cinder at the time. So it was long before he was CEO. And just super briefly, just for people to understand, this is Sundar, what level, what tenure at Google, just to unpick. Yeah, he had only been there maybe like three or four years. So he was, at the time, he was running Toolbar and Google Desktop. I don't know if people remember what that was. Um, Chrome didn't exist yet. So he was kind of running this, we called it the client software world, um, kind of early in his career as well. Uh, and uh, I wanted to go up for promotion. And I was terrified to ask if he thought I was ready. I cared a lot what he thought. Uh, and so I spent, you know, days like prepping, right? Like writing down my notes. What am I going to say? I have this one-on-one. -on -one. So I walk into this one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's on a Friday. Do not have these conversations on a Friday. <laughs> um, and I asked him if he thought I was ready. And he said, no. And I was crushed. I mean, just visibly crushed. So much so that he actually called me on Saturday wow. and asked me if I was okay, because that's how distraught I must have looked in that meeting. Um, and it took me a while, actually, to recover from that and, um, and really take some learning away from that. And the learning that I took away from that was maybe twofold. One was if... I hadn't asked, the outcome would have been the same, right? It wasn't getting the promotion either way, but at least I learned something in the process. When I finally got around to listening to what he said, it was all very constructive. Mm. It all kind of gave me a sense of like, okay, here's the gap. Here's what you need to do. Um, and so I kind of had a target. And, and by the way, I had told my manager what I cared about and something that was important to me, which is actually really good for him to know, right? And then the second piece was, the important part of rejection isn't the answer. It's the narrative that you tell yourself afterwards. Mm. And learning how to, instead of focusing on all the little voices that are like, you do suck, like all those things you were scared of, they're true. <laughs> um, reframing that, right? And and using like positive internal messaging and set. And in fact, neuroscience proves this, right? The, the thought patterns that you have become ingrained in your brain. So if they're negative, they will continue to become more prolific. And if they're positive, they'll have that other effect. Um, and it also gets easier with time. So the more you do it, the easier it gets. Um, I got told no a lot, but each time it was a little bit easier than yeah. last. And you know, I can very much relate to the this whole setup of, you know, asking for promotion and the no. And I think for many people, me included, the first time I heard that, that, that is essentially, it's a horrifying thing. But I learned over the years, right? And then especially when I myself became a manager and a leader, it actually can be a super rational process where really the interest of the company and the interest of the, of the individual are aligned in, by saying, you know, you're valued 
we expect this and that from the next level. And I don't see, I see a lot of A and B and C, but maybe I don't see D and E. If you focus on D and E, and I would love you to grow in that dimension, then you're ready, right? And that's, that's not what we feel when somebody says, no, you're not from automatic. What we feel is I'm bad. I'm terrible. But actually, once you're able to rationalize this, it's actually a very, very productive process, right? And I think, uh, if I like look at my own growth at Google, right? This was exactly that, like being told by well-meaning people, by the way, right? That's the thing I get. Sundar was well-meaning with you. Um, please develop that and that and then then that's what we expect right and it's it's clarity it's uh it's it's it's, helpful. it's very helpful yeah. yeah one clarification right there's this imposter syndrome uh thing right it's sort of a meme everybody knows it are we talking about that or is that yet another thing or how will, how would the two relate yeah to me they're they're different they feel a little bit different um there's some similarities right there's obviously you're afraid and you're scared. And, um, but one of the things about imposter syndrome that I found is that it actually never goes away. Um, I was in a board meeting actually just a few weeks ago. And so I'm on, I'm on the board of this, um, civic tech company, which means they kind of sit at the intersection of government and technology and all the gov people were having a conversation using acronyms I didn't understand. And, um, and I was just like, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Um, I don't belong here. Right. And that was kind of what was running through my head. And, um, and I had to maybe use some of the same tactics, right. Which is kind of change that internal narrative to be like, Oh no, I, they didn't bring me on because of my government experience of which I have none. Um, they brought me on for other reasons. Right. So I can kind of reframe that thought, but that for me, like that feeling of, I don't belong here or, I'm not qualified for this never really goes away. And I think all of us, maybe by virtue of you being here, are putting ourselves in in like places where we're really uncomfortable, right? We're putting ourselves with other people that are, you know, uh, expecting a lot from us or want us to contribute in some way or, you know, we can learn from. Um, and so imposter syndrome is just, it's kind of always there. Mm. It's kind of like a bad house guest, right? It kind of just like sits there and you have to like come to terms with the fact that it's next to you and just yeah. turn away. I think it's not a small thing you're saying here that after, I mean, you achieve, I guess, everything one could possibly achieve. And you say the house guest uh, is still there. Yeah, still there. Yeah. How does he look? <laughs> I was just kidding. Uh, okay, so let's maybe if we zoom out a bit, I think we're talking about growth here, right? Um, just a question because you've made so much progress then in, in your career. I guess many of us, right, maybe wonder bigger changes, step changes, right? One, once you're really asked to maybe do something, um, you know, take, I don't know, take a leadership position that you maybe not comfortable with. Uh, talk about that a bit and, you know, maybe what, what you learned there or advice you have there, observations. Yeah. You know, I think there are, um, many different step changes that happen in career. Like one of the first ones is becoming a manager mm -hmm. for the first time. And I remember when I first became a manager, Raphael was one of my first reports. Um, somebody said to me, what got you here won't get you there. And that really stuck with me. And in the context of management, um, what that means, like you're, you were great at execution. And so you got promoted. Congratulations. Um, but if you continue to focus on execution, you're going to be a bad manager, right? Like your team does not want you to focus on execution. That's their job. You have to do something different. Um, and I think it's similar. I, I went through kind of a similar phase when I moved from being a product leader to being a business leader. So, you know, going from something like a head of product or a product to owning the, the business with sales and everything. And it was hard for me actually to let go of the product stuff. I love it. You know, I, I really enjoy it. But if I had focused on that, I would be doing a disservice to the team. I needed to focus on other things like making sure the business was aligned with product and, you know, making sure we had funding and organizational growth and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And I think, you know, what makes it hard for people, what made it hard for me and what I see in, in people I talk to when I mention them is they're scared of the extra capacity that you have all of a sudden, right? You move into this new role and now someone else is doing the job that you used to do. And so you have this space and you have this time 
And it's not clear what you're supposed to fill that with. And so it becomes really comforting or easy to fill it with all the stuff that you already know that you're good at, right? But you have to actually live in that discomfort for a bit to recognize the things that you can do that only you can do, yeah. right? Um, which is why you're in that position in the first place. Uh, and so becoming comfortable with that capacity, I think, is kind of the the change that that needs to happen. Yeah. I remember when I when I also like grew in the company, I remember people thinking about me as a leader that I must be so powerful or it must be so good to have the control, right? And then it's it's such a myth, right? That that it's suddenly easier to be up there. It's actually hard. Right? You know, it's actually really funny. I feel like when I was when I was uh early in my career, I'd be like, oh, those people who sit in that room, Sundar's room, whoever's room was, like they must know what they're doing. Right. When I get there, like I'm gonna know what I'm doing. And then you get in the room and you're like, oh, nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. one. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> It's scary, but also relieving, I guess, right? <laughs> that realization, yeah. Um, talk a bit about mentors and sponsors. I think we both benefited from people that, you know, were on our side in, in Google, but uh, what, how do they relate? Are they same? Are they different? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I, it's, I like talking about this because I think for me personally, mentors and sponsors have been so critical um, in my career. So, I I find, you know, there's there's been a lot of talk about it recently, but I find people often conflate the two things. And I think they're actually very different. So mentors are people who you go to for advice. They can be peers, they can be managers, they can be, you know, anyone who gives you a different perspective and, you know, cares enough to to give you advice along the way. Um, and what I find for me to be really helpful is actually to have a board of mentors, right? Like kind of a board of directors for me, people who think about things differently and will ask me different questions. So I remember I was working in the education team kind of early on and I was trying to decide whether to acquire a company. I wasn't sure, you know, I was like, I hadn't done it before. I wasn't sure if it was the right thing. And so I called up somebody who had been um, a previous manager of mine, who's a mentor of mine, who's kind of a disruptive thinker, right? And I called him to ask him and talk him through it to kind of get his take. Uh, which was great for that situation. You know, if I was dealing with, you know, a poor performer or somebody on my team probably don't want the disruptive thinker at that point, that might be unhelpful. Um, but having that kind of collection of people has been really useful for me. On the sponsor side, sponsors are kind of like mentors, but they have power and they have power to make change for you as an individual. And I feel lucky enough, I had some great sponsors um, along the way in my career. I think one of the most salient times um, that that has come into play for me was um, when I had my first child. Uh, I was coming back from maternity leave and the team that I would have gone back to wasn't the right fit. The manager there just wasn't really... Uh, keen on having people on his team that had children. And so it wasn't the right fit. And I didn't honestly know uh, where to go. And so Sundar actually stepped in and said, just come to my team. Uh, I will, I will take care of it. I don't have a role for you yet. I don't know what you're going to do, but I'll take care of it. And I'll make sure that you have something that, um, that you get excited about. And so that's how I ended up actually running Chrome. Um, because there were some movement that happened and, and I ended up uh, with that role and it was an amazing change. But I think if he hadn't been there in that moment, um, I think things could have turned out very differently. And I mean, this might be a stupid question, but why did he do that? I mean, I, I know it was important for you, but he could have also not cared. Why did he care? He's a good person. Um, but I'm sure there must be people he could care about. But He, cared he does about care you. a lot of, a lot of people. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting about sponsorship, I find, is that it's really based on this deep personal relationship that you have with someone. So I worked for Sundar multiple times, actually, throughout my career at Google. I kind of boomeranged back to him a few times. Um, and I think we built that relationship over time. And so I think he is one of those people that cares 
Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, I don't think everybody is a great sponsor. I don't, I I think it takes work and it takes energy and attention, right. To care about other people in that way. Um, And he was just really great at that. Uh, I think another thing, you know, often I get asked like, well, how do you build that relationship with somebody? How do you build sponsorship? Because if you don't have it, it becomes really difficult. I do think this kind of like being with someone in the trenches, like building that trust is really key. And that trust goes both ways, right? Trust that this person's going to look out for you, but also trust that they're trusting you, right? Because they're putting their reputation on the line for you. Um, And trust is also transferable. It's a currency, right? Like, you know, um, if you have somebody that's looking out for you and that trusts you, they can transfer that trust to someone else. Mm. And then all of a sudden you have that new relationship with someone. Um, And one thing someone said to me is as you get more senior promotions, get less spare, Mm. which is true. So that sponsorship really, really becomes important. Yeah. Just curious about the Sundar piece, because now we know he's the CEO of of Google or Alphabet or both. Um, Was it obvious to you that he would go far? Because, I mean, I guess you started with when you were for junior. This must have been a very different thing or or maybe not. Or did you expect him to go that far? I'm incredibly clairvoyant. No, I see. Um, No, I'm not. Um, No, you know, I think in the early days, you know, we were all just working. I think maybe like maybe many years in, there were kind of like, oh, Sundar could take over the company one day. But I think for me, really, what it was that drew me to him is um it was he was just a really he was really kind. Mm-hmm. He was a good people manager. He really cared. Um, he was thoughtful. And I remember kind of early in my career when I first started working for him, being like, oh, I want to grow up to be him one day. Like I can... That was a bit of a role model. Yeah, you know, and to me that was really important because it was somebody I could emulate too, you know, and we had very similar styles. And so um, that was why I kept coming back to him. Um, But there was something, there was something unique about him always. I mean, it's, it's, you. for example, what you did not say just now is... Oh, because he was powerful, right? I mean, you could imagine if you think about selecting a sponsor, I guess, or mentor or both, you, you could think about somebody who was clearly powerful, right? Mm. But you didn't say that, right? You talked about style, trust, um, good, right? I'm just noticing. It's interesting. It's um, much more human than normally maybe what you would think, right? About, okay, who can help me in this company? Just an observation. Um so you were at Google for almost 20 years, which is unbelievable. Like almost since, how old is Google on 25? Like you were... F- 2005, so... No, t- no, yes. No, sorry. You were almost 20, right. but Google yeah. exactly five years yeah, yeah, before. Yeah, How big was Google when you joined? Like roughly uh, a thousand About people. a thousand people. That's crazy. Absolutely yeah. Insane. But then you made bigger changes, right? I know it's now with hindsight, every story sounds sort of obvious, but I'm sure... I mean, as every story, it is not obvious in in the making. Talk about making big changes and mm. how you went about going there. On that. Yeah, I moved around a lot uh, at Google. I think um, many of them actually early in the career were, I would maybe call them obvious changes, right? Like you're kind of moving up, you're moving along. And then uh, in 2016, I probably made the first big move that was eyebrow raising maybe is the way to put it. So I was leaving Chrome at the time. Um, and it, on paper, it was amazing. I, we were kind of like in the center of things. I was running this big team. I was speaking at our conferences. Um, I had articles published about things. I was, I mean, on paper, it was like great. It was amazing. Um, but something was nagging at me and it didn't feel quite right. And I had kind of long been interested in working in education. You know, I was lucky enough to have parents that really cared about giving me a really good education. You know, they were first generation immigrants to the U.S. And so they put all their energy into um, into making sure that we were well educated, went to good schools. I think my dad drove two hours each way just to get us in the public school district in Alabama that you know, um, was supposed to be, you know, had good, good teachers. Um, and 
so I had this kind of thing in the back of my head. I was like, I kind of want to do something in the space, but like I have a really good thing going over here. Um, and so I decided uh, while I was on maternity leave, probably sleep deprived, that I should look into it. Um, so I spent some time like talking to people, reading, researching, and kind of came to this place where I was like, you know what, I want to do something at the intersection of technology and education, see if there's any impact I can make at all. And actually, Google's a really good place to do this, given all our AI and advances there and long before chat GPT. But um, I really wanted to focus on the learning and seeing if we could could move learning. So I put this pitch together for Sundar, who was then CEO at the time. And I remember walking into that room being afraid um, that he was going to say yes. Because if he said yes, then I actually had to do it. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. I um, I didn't know if I wanted to let go of this thing that I had built, this like career that I had built, to go start from scratch by myself, like not knowing where it was going to go. And I think a big part of that was my the prestige I felt with my job had become so closely tied to my identity. And it was actually interesting. These social psychologists, um, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, run these experiments. And what they show is that losing things that we have costs more to us than gaining those same things before we have them. So as an example, like let's say you're going to buy a pen from somebody. The amount you're willing to pay for that pen is about half as much as you would charge for that pen once it's in your possession, right? So we hold on to these things that are ours very deeply and letting go of them is really tough, right? Yeah. I mean, works with pens. Like if it's your identity, it's, it's yeah. really tough to kind of separate from that. And so that was kind of one of the first steps where I had to really ask myself, what am I optimizing for right now? And the answer that came back to me was, I want to see if I can make an impact in education. And having that optimization function clearly in my mind was so important for the next few years because it was rough going for a while. Um, but that's why I was doing it. And that's why I was there. And um, it gave me maybe the strength or the courage, I guess, to step away from the prestige of this role that I had into something completely new. Yeah. I guess you said something really important here, right? You, you said, yes, there's loss and that loss is, is painful. Everything you have and that you perceive as a loss, but then you had something to gain, right? And, but you had clarity in your case, it was maybe having impact, maybe some curiosity, but I guess it's an important point, right? Like without like throwing away something you have without knowing what for might be, might be tough, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a good segue to, I guess, the ultimate growth step that actually both of us took in a way, which is, uh, why would you ever leave Google and that career and everything you had there working for people that probably adore you? Why did you leave and how did you go about leaving? Yeah. Leaving Google was probably the hardest decision I've made in my career um, by far. In fact, it probably took me 10 years to make that decision. Um, it was really tough. Uh, and again, it was one of these situations where like everything was perfect on paper, right? Like I was running the education team. I loved it. Uh, it was the only job I wanted. Um, and uh, it was amazing people. They were talented. They were motivated. It was COVID. And so like kids were depending on us, right? Like kids for real. Um, and you could easily see the impact of the work, right? Um, and so it, it was great in all of those respects, perfect on paper. But I had this nagging feeling that had grown maybe over those 10 years that something wasn't right. And, you know, I wasn't like the balance was a little bit off, I guess. Like I wasn't the parent I wanted to be uh, necessarily um, or the partner or um, my health wasn't what it should be, maybe. And I think part of it is me, right? Like I, I, um, I don't know, 
took my job pretty seriously and and took a lot of stress from that. And so some of that is maybe self-inflicted. Um, By the way, I've all rarely seen anybody, really, I'm saying this, ever so dedicated to a job than you. I remember that working for you. And I, I guess it's a blessing and a curse. That's exactly what you're saying, right? The yeah. bar. It's one of those things where like the strength becomes a weakness, yes. you know, in those 360s yeah. that you do. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah, no, too far. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I kind of, I had this like feeling, just like, okay, this doesn't seem right. Um, and I remember I was having a conversation with somebody about it and they said, the business will take care of itself. Only you can take care of you. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that really resonated, but it didn't make it easier mm-hmm. to be honest. Um, because there was so much fear. I think I like, I even have it on my phone still. I took a Google keep note and I wrote down all the things I was afraid of like all of them in order. And it was like everything from, I will never find a job again to my kids won't respect me anymore. Um, like kind of these like deep seated things, right? Like my daughter, uh, who's 11 now was really proud of me. Yeah. Right. She like, I worked on Google classroom. She would go into her class and be like, my mommy does that, you know? Um, and so there was like these deep, deep fears, uh, about, leaving because it wasn't just leaving Google, right? Like it was leaving a job and not going to something else. Um, and at the root of all of that fear was really this piece about identity. Mm. I really didn't know who I was mm. without my job. Mm. Um, and in fact, that was the reason I left because I realized it was important for me to like push on that. Yeah. Right. To really say, like, no, this identity association is probably not healthy. Um, So let me see what exists beyond this. Let me break that um, and and see what's on the other side of it. And it's still really hard. I mean, it's been two years and three days. Not that I'm counting. Um, (laughs) Since I left Google. Um, And it's, it's still difficult. It's still because that, you know, that connection is really strong. Yeah. Now, we're both talking, of course, of, you know, it's also a privilege, right, that we are actually able to yes. make those moves. Now, if I reflect, right, we have folks from all kind of seniority levels and countries and situations. If we try to make this applicable and uh, actionable for folks here, right, like, what would you advise folks if they think about change, right? There were good nuggets already what is the what is the stuff that you would say with that experience that outstanding experience you would wish others would maybe know or or make part of the 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 thoughts their journey yeah and it's a really good call out i do feel really lucky to be able to make some of these changes um i would say there's probably two things one is take risks like early in your career throughout your career um experiment make change, do things that feel uncomfortable. And going back to the point about um, those moments of discomfort, if you like embracing those and kind of working through those, that's where the change happens. Um, The personal growth, the professional growth, because you never know, right, where it's going to lead. But if you work through those moments of fear, um, I think it becomes really powerful. Mm -hmm. And the fear is actually like, if you're deciding something, it actually goes in the pros column, not the cons column, right? Because it's actually, it's it's a good positive signal. And, you know, one of the tricks that I've used when I make some of these changes, um, because it's, it's not obvious in the moment, right? You don't know in the moment whether the fear is a good fear or it's a lion staring you in the face fear, right? It doesn't, it's like those two fears kind of feel the same. Um, and so one of the things that I have a practice of doing when I am making these changes is that if I'm deciding between two things, I will make the decision to myself, right? I will say, okay, this is what I'm going to say, but I will tell no one. And then I will sleep on it. And the next day, if I still feel okay about it, that is what I will do. And again, it sounds obvious in retrospect, like, I don't know, your subconscious is working through it. But for me, it like, having made the decision only for myself gives me like peace, Mm -hmm. right? It, It gives me time to make peace with it. Um, before I have to go commit to somebody else. And there have been times where I wake up the next day. I'm like, no. Did you do this to me? 
<laughs> almost. Almost. <laughs> almost. Uh, I almost didn't do the talk last night. I was I was good with this one, but last night I almost failed. Um, but that was the reason I did it, because I was scared to do it. Um, uh, so that, that would be one thing. Take the risks. Embrace the fear that's associated with those risks. I think the second one um, is really to define your own success. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really easy for me throughout my life to take someone else's success metric as my own. And, and really it was like my dad, right? Like my dad was like, oh, like you have to like, you know, really work hard and, you know, be important, whatever it is. Right. And, and so I internalized that. And like, that was my success metric for a really long time until it wasn't working anymore. And it took me almost 20 years of working and maybe long before that, when I was, you know, in college or school, or whatever else, to recognize that it wasn't working. Um, or it was no longer working is maybe the right way to say it. And, you know, and so I took those steps to say, okay, what am I optimizing for now? What do I want to do next? And I wish I had done it earlier. Mm. I wish I had, you know, not just done it earlier, but also more frequently to ask myself those hard questions. Yeah. Um, because I do think being able to define your own success as your life changes and unfolds and your definitions of success change over time, um, being able to stay true to that is yeah. really important. You know, when I had my own journey that wasn't that long, but I think equally intense about leaving, I had a coach and, um, which by the way, I can always recommend in those situations, like mentor sponsor coach. And then she said something very simple that stuck with me. It's so simple and so powerful for me, at least. She said, outside in versus inside out. And it's it's almost trivial, right? But her point was, up to this point, when I decided to maybe leave or, or consider leaving, everything up to this point in my life, in the on the business side, let's say, or professional side, was outside in. You know, I did my MBA. I did computer science. I did... Every I jumped through every hoop that Google gave me successfully and earned this and that, right? But the pattern is it is outside in. Somebody else is giving me a success metric, right? And I think she helped me immensely by, by just phrasing it that what she observed in me in that moment when I voiced concerns or or doubts, you know, is this is your inside out moment, right? This is you inside feeling something's off that doesn't feel right anymore but that's valuable right and then and then suddenly that becomes the compass it reminded me a little bit of that right? like becoming aware the signal and then starting maybe to rationalize what is the inside right yeah. versus the outside anyways yeah and definitely not recommending everybody go quit their job i don't want to get hate mail <laughs> from like everybody's managers being like what did you do <laughs> um but i do think again like asking yourself the questions like what is what is important to me right now yeah. and how do I align my work and my life and all of that? Too? And even if you stay at the company, right? Exactly. We don't want to encourage everybody to leave, but even if you stay, there is an element, you said this before, like nobody else will take care of you and I guess your career even, right? Even yeah. if you stay, it really is valuable to think about, you know, am I making the right trade-offs? Am I making the right choices even within that job, right? Mm -hmm. Or should I maybe change even something? Should I voice something, right? Should I aspire to something, right? Like the, yeah, this moment of clarity, I think is helpful in, in any case. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Good. Thank you so much, Avni. Just wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah.